Good morning, good evening to everybody. Welcome to the webinar on um, that is hosted by FAO on food waste prevention in times of crisis. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought undoubtedly a crisis at many levels, including on our food systems. Unfortunately, the crisis on our food system highlighted many of the fragilities that we have to face now and weaknesses. So this was a, like a wake up call and the, on the need to address disruptions in the production and distribution of food, as well as on access. Um, therefore, concerted multi-actor actions are required globally to maximize the use of food that is produced, that is transported and distributed, and it is accessed by consumers worldwide, including in our region. Now, mitigating the severe impacts of COVID-19 pandemic and the response measures will require collaborative and innovative approaches. The webinar will bring together experts from different sectors to share their first-hand experience and discuss solutions and practices that may be adopted to prevent and reduce food waste at the different stages of the food supply chain. In this unprecedented situation, of course, however, many of the messages that we are going to receive today are equally valid also after we are going to um, deal with the pandemic. Before starting, please allow me to take a note of, of some technical information on the arrangements of the meeting. The language options are English and Russian interpretation. You can switch language by clicking on the small globe icon at the bottom of your screen. We are expecting your questions and comments. We are welcome your contribution. For this, please use the question and answer box at the bottom of your screens. Now we are going to answer either um, directly or in writing. Please indicate your name and the organization that you represent when you are going to address your question. The webinar is being recorded and broadcasted as well on YouTube. Now, please uh, allow me to introduce um, the video for the webinar, after which we can start with the first speaker, Robert Van Otterdijk. I think we already had the video, right? So it's now my turn to speak. Um, good, good morning, everybody. I'm very uh, happy to be here and to welcome you all to this uh, webinar on um, uh, food waste and in times of crisis. I, I should say that uh, already since uh, almost 10 years ago, the Safe Food Initiative of FEO, the Global Initiative on food loss and waste reduction in collaboration with public and private sector partners, uh, took an, uh, an uh, active approach towards a reduction of food waste in addition to the old food loss program that FAO already was implementing for many decades or so. And we did that especially in collaboration with the EU projects, fusions, and later refresh. And one of the most important um, topics to address food waste was the recovery and redistribution of surplus food, meaning that food which is at risk to get wasted but which is not wasted yet will be recovered and saved from being wasted and redistributed to people to eat through all kinds of different uh, channels. Uh, for this uh, uh, concept we have uh, developed uh, a few uh, elaborative policies and implemented these uh, in different programs in the regions where FEO is working. And uh, it, it is clearly focusing on the, the food supply chain approach and the problems that exist there to match supply with demand. And, and, and this, this, this problem has always been there in any food supply chain, but now in the time of the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, we see that many food supply chains have been distorted and disrupted because of the restrictive measures implemented to fight the spread of the disease. And then we can think, for instance, of closing of the horeca, hotel, restaurant and catering in many 
uh, countries, making that the suppliers of food products to these horeca establishments now are left with surplus foods which they can't sell anymore, especially at, at farm level, uh, who have direct supply to this, to this sector. Uh, then, in many cases, exports have been uh, uh, suspended. Um, and at the consumer level, we can see that because of the COVID pandemic, uh, the whole economy has collapsed and many people have lost their jobs in all kinds of businesses, making, uh, causing a situation that many consumers, especially in lower middle income countries, are uh, uh, reaching the poverty line and are becoming food insecure. In that way, they are uh, getting more dependent on uh, charity or food banks uh, to, to, to get to their basic needs in terms of food supply. Then at farmer level, apart from uh, the loss of markets, uh, you can also see that uh, because of the pandemic, immigration labor has been suspended uh, because many of these farms rely on immigrant labor, seasonal labors to harvest the crops, uh, but also in the processing industry, this type of uh, labor is required. And, and, and that is now also a problem. Besides that, many of these industries uh, also had to close down Etc. And, and as a long, longer term spin off, we may uh, notice that because of the pandemic and the economic collapse, many, especially small and medium scale businesses in the, in the food supply chains, like restaurants, like uh, food processors, like small retailers, will go bankrupt. And uh, therefore, uh, it will take a long time for after the, the pandemic has gone, it will take a long time before the economy is recovering and the food supply chain start operating uh, and functioning uh, well. And therefore, it is uh, more than ever opportune to, um, uh, to establish uh, online platforms where suppliers and users or buyers of food products can find each other and uh, find alternative outlets for the food products and find alternative sources for the uh, supply so that we uh, fix as much as possible this uh, disrupted food supply chains and reduce the food waste that would be the, the consequence of that. Uh, so uh, we have been uh, working with uh, some other organizations on a, on a general project proposal for that, which is now in the making and uh, which we hope to implement uh, as soon as possible at uh, national level in a number of, of countries. Uh, and therefore, I'm very happy that in this uh, webinar now, we are going to address particularly this type of issues that are at stake. And uh, I would be uh, uh, I'm very grateful to all the, the panelists and the speakers that are going to, to share their experience and their plans and, and activities with us. Thank you very much. Um, the floor is back to Camelia, I think. Thank you very much, Robert. Indeed, you have underlined many of the difficulties that the food supply chain actors face, as well as consumers face in accessing the food from the food supply chain. Um, I would like to highlight the medium and small size uh, food services that you have highlighted that face indeed bankruptcy, for instance, in many of the cases we have seen this happening as well as recovery and redistribution from other actors in the food supply chain. So in the face of this challenge that COVID has highlighted and has uh, so much under, underscored that we need to face um, whether we are ready or not, there are indeed some solutions. You have mentioned recovery and distribution. You have mentioned how consumers can also engage in actions. And you have mentioned that platforms, online platforms such as the project that FAO would like to launch in the region and um, engage with at country level are also available. So uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce the first keynote speaker, Angela Frigo. Uh, she is the Secretary General of the European Food Banks Federation. Now, the European Food Banks Federation represents 430 food banks in 29 European countries. Angela will kindly provide an overview on how the COVID pandemic has impacted FIBA's activities, the challenges and successes that the um, that FIBA has uh, registered in the in the last year, and um, I would like to give the floor now to Angela. Thank you very much, Angela. The floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Camilla, for your kind introduction. And um, I would like also to thank you for this invitation. Uh, so I will share my presentation on the screen. And just give me uh, a feedback that it's working. I can okay. see the presentation. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so as Camilla uh, said, um, I will give you a very quick overview about the European Food Banks Federation, and then I will focus my uh, speech on the uh, impact of COVID uh, on the activity of our members. Uh, so as she said, we represent, um, well, the organization was based, uh, was established in 1986. Uh, we are uh, currently based in Brussels, and we represent and support 29 members uh, across Europe. And uh, the mission of food banks is double. Uh, so on, on one hand, we prevent food waste uh, through the recovery and redistribution of edible and safe uh, surplus food. So uh, food, as it was said, that it's perfectly uh, edible and that uh, for many different reasons cannot be uh, sold to the final consumer. And thanks to the activity, so thanks to the recovery and redistribution of food banks, it's um, saved from becoming food waste. And on the other hand, so the, the second, let's say, uh, mission of the food banks is to redistribute this food um, to charities uh, supporting people in need. And in this way, uh, we also try to contribute to food waste, uh, to food insecurity reduction, uh, providing a support to thousands of charities, uh, providing food to millions uh, of vulnerable people uh, and families in Europe. And here I will show you um, the impact of the activity of our members uh, in 2019. And I think that this is important because then we will see uh, the difference between uh, 2019 and 2020. Um, so as you can see, uh, we uh, represent a network of 430 food banks. And last year they redistributed more than uh, uh, 700,000 tons of food. And 70% of this food is surplus food. So it's coming from the whole food supply chain, from agriculture, uh, from food and drink manufacturers, from the distribution sector, and also from the food service. Uh, and then uh, there is also food coming from uh, the Fund for European Aid to the Most Deprived, from uh, food collections. Uh, so it's food which is donated by citizens. Um, and also fruit and vegetables which are withdrawn from the market uh, within the common agricultural policy in order to stabilize the, uh, the, the prices. Uh, but uh, again, 70% of the total amount of food that was redistributed last year uh, was surplus food. And uh, it's equivalent to 4.2 million daily meals. Uh, and then the food was redistributed to, to more than 45,000 charities. And um, charities are, are really, and there is a variety of charities, uh, so like soup kitchens, but also food pantries, uh, shelters for homeless people, uh, communities uh, for disabled people or for families. And these charities support uh, nine, well, supported last year, 9.5 uh, million deprived people. And um, another element that I would like to highlight is that uh, our activity we are no profit organizations and our activity is possible thanks to um, the involvement of um, a lot of volunteers. Uh, so in total, we have more than 32,000 co-workers and 84% of them are volunteers. Uh, so this is the picture of last year. And then coming to um, this year and the impact of the COVID uh, on our organization. Uh, so what we have done as European Food Banks Federation, uh, we have tried to support uh, as much as possible our members. And we have done this also uh, monitoring and assessing uh, the evolution and the impact of the, of the pandemic on their daily activity. And we conducted several surveys and we also released uh, some reports that are available on our website uh, for more information. And I will give you uh, some highlights, especially as regards the challenges that, and some of these challenges were already mentioned also by Robert at the beginning, uh, but also some uh, solutions and also what are uh, the future um, 
let's say, uh, what is the future outlook uh, for our activity. Uh, so the first thing that I would like to, to stress is that um, food banks have always been uh, up and running. Uh, they have never closed uh, even during uh, the lockdowns. Uh, we have just a few exceptions um, in some countries in order to avoid uh, the contact with people and the spread of the pandemic, but otherwise the food banks has always remained open. And um, they have faced uh, an increased demand uh, for food. Uh, so at European level, we are uh, recording a 30% uh, increase of food demand. Um, and the range goes from 6% uh, up to 90% uh, in the different countries. And here you can see also uh, a map um, with the different countries. And it's true that this is uh, a new poverty. Uh, and as it was said before, uh, there are a lot of people who have lost their job due to the, due to the crisis, due to the pandemic, uh, but also um, many families with children. Uh, so families who were relying on schools uh, for the meals of their children and also a lot of elderly people who are living alone and uh, uh, due to the pandemic and to social distancing are feeling uh, even more uh, the loneliness and the fact that they are living alone. So this is again, a new kind of poverty that was not existing just a few months ago at the beginning of the year. And uh, it has a, a real impact on, um, on our community. Uh, then another element and another challenge uh, that uh, was faced by our food banks was that they had to uh, adapt their operations um, very quickly uh, in order to, to respond to the uh, evolution of the pandemic. And um, most of our members, uh, so at the beginning, there was really a fluctuation uh, of the food, uh, of the supply of food, uh, because as it was said also before, uh, well, food and drink manufacturers, but also the distribution sectors, had to reorganize their internal procedures. Uh, they were uh, affected, especially supermarkets, by panic buying. So some of our traditional donors had no available surplus food for us at the beginning of the pandemic, especially in the first wave. But at the same time, we were contacted by many um, restaurants uh, and by the food service sector because they had uh, due to the fact that they were forced to close uh, the restaurants, they had a lot of available surplus food. But as you can imagine, uh, this is a totally different logistics uh, because it meant to uh, recover, to pick up food from uh, thousands of different uh, locations. And in most of the cases, uh, it's, um, it was uh, chilled and frozen food uh, with a very short expiry um, um, shelf life. And um, especially in a period where uh, restrictions were in place, and so people couldn't uh, move uh, around as usual. And at the same time, we also faced a shortage of volunteers, because as I said, uh, our activity is based on volunteers, but most of our volunteers are over 65. And so they were uh, a group at risk um, to, to be affected by uh, the pandemic. And last but not least, we also faced uh, a drop in financial resources uh, because uh, well, um, our members had uh, unexpected expenses. So for example, for uh, buying uh, the personal protective equipment for the volunteers and the employees. Uh, so this is, um, these are the challenges. And I would say that they were uh, really, um, they had a real impact on our activity. Um, but, at the same time, I would like to uh, highlight that the food banks have expressed their full creativity and also professionalism. And I would like to give you just uh, a few concrete examples from some countries uh, that could be also replicated in other countries. So that could be uh, considered as an example. And I'm sure that then uh, also our uh, Hungarian uh, member in, in the panel discussion later on will provide more uh, examples. Uh, so. Uh, for example, we recovered the surplus food from the restaurants and the cafeterias of the European institutions in Brussels uh, when the offices were closed. Or, uh, for example, in Belgium, the food banks were um, um, involved in the recovery of tons of potatoes from local farmers. Uh, in France, uh, there were many airline companies uh, which decided to donate their food 
or soft drinks uh, to the food banks. Um, in Germany, there was also an awareness campaign um, to explain uh, to the final to the charities and also the final beneficiaries of the of the charities uh, the difference between uh, the best before date and the use by date. Or in Lithuania, for example, the food banks invited the citizens to donate uh, the food that was stockpiled uh, during uh, the lockdown, so uh, that was purchased during uh, the panic buying. Or uh, in the in Italy, which was uh, one of the most effective countries, um, the food bank uh, increased the quantities of surplus food recovered from catering uh, companies due to the forced closures. Um, a lot of fruit and vegetables were donated to the food banks in Netherlands, or for example, in Norway, the food bank decided to establish um, a new kitchen uh, within the food bank, uh, within the, the warehouse, where they have started to prepare uh, meals for the charities so that in this way, uh, then the redistribution for the charities and for people in need is uh, easier uh, because they can provide uh, ready uh, meals uh, with a very good nutritional value. Um, but also in Spain, for example, uh, the food banks uh, are redistributing rice, which is produced with the coffee um, of the recycled capsule um, of some companies. And uh, the last example that I would like to share with you is that um, some food banks decided also to uh, rethink and to reorganize their activity, uh, preparing uh, the food parcels, the, the food banks for the charities, so that in this way uh, it was easier than to reach um, the final beneficiaries. Uh, so these are just some very, I'll say, concrete examples of the activity and how the activity has changed uh, during the pandemic. Um, and so some of the learnings, um, let's say that first of all, we have um, uh, showed evidence that the food banks can adapt and respond effectively to uh, the, uh, the, the needs of society. Uh, they have adapted their activity uh, and they have been a reliable partner, well, not only for the charities assisting people in need, but um, first of all, for uh, the food supply chain, uh, because they have uh, provided a solution to food waste prevention during the pandemic. Um, and, um, and so we think that the activity of the food banks should be uh, really uh, recognized as a part of the food supply chain of the food system and not just as one good option uh, for uh, a social purpose, uh, but also technology and um, digital tools have been really important uh, to support the activity. And for example, uh, as European Food Banks Federation, we have organized a lot of um, online meetings with our members and at the beginning, we were a little bit uh, afraid that uh, digital tools were not so, uh, well, our members were not so familiar with digital tools, but uh, actually these kind of meetings uh, have allowed us to, um, to close the gap and to, to have a, a, re a regular dialogue with our members. And, um, and just the, the last comment that I would like to share is that, um, well, unfortunately, I'll say, we are only at the beginning of the real crisis uh, because, uh, well, we know that we are uh, experiencing uh, an health emergency, uh, well, especially right now, uh, but for sure um, it's already evident um, the COVID-19, this crisis will have uh, a long lasting uh, effect uh, on, the, on our society uh, in terms of uh, social impact and economic impact. Uh, so we will uh, need to um, recover more food also in the future for more people. And um, here I would like just to share with you some uh, pictures uh, of our volunteers uh, from different countries, um, because really I think that um, they are uh, the key uh, element of our activity. So it's uh, the activity is made possible thanks to the volunteers and the employees that are involved every day. But uh, we have received a lot of support also from citizens, from businesses, and also from public administrations. 
Uh, so really, uh, generosity has been um, um, leveraged to uh, improve our activity. Um, and last, uh, I would like to uh, just to, to conclude saying that, uh, well, all this is not enough because as I said, and here uh, you can see the figures of 2019, uh, but unfortunately we are already experiencing a 30% increase in food demand. Uh, so we will need to recover more food and uh, in order to support more people. And in this way, we will have also the possibility to prevent uh, food waste from, um, uh, um, from being generated. And so we need uh, the help of everyone. And I hope that, uh, well, opportunities like uh, uh, the meeting of today, the, the webinar of today are really um, important because we can share information and we can also learn from each other. And we can find maybe uh, new collaborations uh, that could help us to, um, to reach this goal uh, of preventing food waste and at the same time to support uh, those are most in need. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Angela, for your great work. I would like to highlight now some of the points that uh, stuck uh, uh, particularly for me. And, um, and I, I would say that overall, uh, the food banks have been uh, very efficient in adapting, as you have said as well. And uh, this adaptation involved many aspects, such as an optimization of your um, resources, because the resources level dropped, an optimization of the operations, and uh, a way to reach out even more demand, a higher demand, 30% a higher uh, in increase. So this increase and expansion had to be addressed somehow, as you have also stated, the logistics were a huge challenge for you, for you also to adapt to different kinds of suppliers, such as food services, restaurants in particular, as well as the, the way on how to support your operations through volunteers that have mainly played a role of, um, of uh, managing the supply and the demand to, to date. So having to deal with both logistics and uh, support of uh, from volunteers in the same time, this kind of, um, let's say, the double challenge you have faced um, has really, let's say, brought up the, the issue that you have also mentioned that in the future, because the um, poverty line dropped, so the more there are more and more people that want to access your, your food. So in the future, you will have to continue to address this challenge. So it's not something that is going to go away anytime soon. Therefore, you have also mentioned some of the opportunities that countries have uh, identified and implemented. I would like to highlight here in particular the awareness that uh, was uh, conducted in Germany for the use by and best before date. Indeed, awareness is, is a key aspect that consumers always um, have, let's say, the need to be to be informed in a, in a good way. So this is an opportunity that uh, Germany picked up quickly. In Italy, uh, the catering surplus indeed from, from food services was an issue that we have highlighted and, um, and other countries as well have dealt with. And uh, this is very important because it connects with how Norway dealt with um, the food banks operations by launching a kitchen. So while in Italy you had to deal with food that was already prepared and at the level of the food supply chain, so you had to recover it and redistribute it as quick as possible. In Norway, the food banks have adapted in a different way by launching a kitchen themselves and cooking the meals for their demand, for their customers. So I would like to then conclude on your presentation saying that um, the food banks are working throughout the food supply chains as you have also mentioned, they recover more than 70% of, of, of the products that they distribute is recovered food. So it's available at the food supply chain level. Therefore, I, I would say that um, there is room to actually consider even more closely with the food supply chain actors on how operations from food banks can continually to support the, um, the consumers also after the pandemic has passed. Now, I would like to pass the floor to Liliana. Liliana 
uh, Anovati uh, Jakob is um, the head of the agricultural unit of the United Nations Economic Commissions for Europe. She is responsible for sustainable food trade, food loss and waste, quality infrastructure and trade standards. Now, Liliana is going to focus her presentation today on the FIDAP at UN, a digital food loss and waste management system. This system is designed to trace and quantify food that is removed from the food supply chain and make it available for redistribution, donating further as well for processing. Now, Liliana, you have the floor. Thank you very much for being here today with us. Thank you very much, Camilia. And I would like to call on the team to bring up my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so as Camilia said, um, I'm with the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe based in Geneva. And uh, we are not only looking obviously here at the crisis situation, but also as was said by Angela, the situation beyond. Let me start with what was before. Next slide, please. And what happened in a very highly efficient country where I live in Switzerland. In a highly efficient country, great agriculture, great technology, we're still facing 2.6 million tons of food loss every year. You see the other numbers on the screen, um, around 225,000 tons of this loss comes from agriculture. Um, a lot of this could be avoided, but all this has consequences. Crisis or not, it impacts the economy, there are financial losses. If you look at 600 million francs per year caused by avoidable losses, it causes social um, losses and obviously economic effects. Serious implications here as well for food security and obviously also for accelerating any kind of progress towards uh, SDG 12.3. The, the big um, takeaway here is that food loss in the early and the pre-retail stage, a food loss that we have not looked into extensively in the past years remains massive, no matter where and which country we're talking about. Next slide, please. Quick example also on what happens at company level, just a quick example, 100 fully loaded standard trucks per year, 7.9 million lost every year, plus of course to that we have to add incineration costs. So already pre-crisis, we had sort of a little crisis going on here that was a bit hidden to all of us. Next slide, please. As uh, Robert and Angela pointed out, uh, the impact of the COVID-19 for once and for all showed us that we have distorted food supply chains and they were even more supported by this crisis. But come a drought, come a hurricane, come any other weather condition, the, the effect might be exactly the same. The various impacts on labor, on borders, on exports, on imports, resulted in food surplus, in waste, and as we could see, the food banks having to face a huge demand that we had never seen before. For 2021, the outlook is not great. The prognostic is not good, and we can certainly not count on any fantastic recovery hitting us in the coming month. Next slide, please. Angela pointed to the fact that we need to improve efficiency and we need to leverage on technology. And I think these are two very, very valid points and they lead me to what you see here in red, the tracing, the quantifying, the analyzing. If we do not know where this food leaves the supply chain, how much is left, who lets it leave it, and we cannot analyze this, we will always just work with little pieces of the puzzle. We will never have the full picture. Obviously, as Angela pointed out as well, and Camelia as well, we need to support a fast distribution. And this fast distribution means leveraging on technology. Whether the fast distribution happens for towards a charity, towards a food bank, or remains commercial, meaning towards processing or any other uh, use, that remains to be seen. But these two elements, they need to go together. And uh, they obviously can help us handle the immediate effects of any kind of crisis, particularly this one, obviously, but also rebuild a bit more 
with the aim of building more robust, more transparent, faster reacting supply chains. Next slide, please. And this is where we come from. Um, we have created something we call Feed Up at UN. We have uh, looked at these two components, namely systematic tracing of food loss and number two, online distribution. Be this a marketplace, be this uh, a, a food bank, whatever it is, a distribution that can happen fast. And all this, we're doing why? because there's a lot of invisible food. Maybe the 158 participants to this seminar know about this food. Many, many others outside don't. So the food recovery and discovery via and distribution via alternative and flexible supply chains is very important. Activating what we call a business case, a distribution case, a supply chain case for this invisible food. Now, what am I talking about? Next slide, please. The food supply chain is long. Feed up at UN, which is a blockchain supported system, looks at all the food loss happening along this long supply chain. And it provides governments, but also the private sector with intelligence, with reports, with analytics, and it will tell you how much you actually saved, because that is very important. Saved in terms of food, how many tons of food, how many kilos of food did we save? Same, save uh, savings in terms of CO2, savings in terms of water um, resources. And that brings me to something Angela pointed out before as well, efficiency, very important. We need to improve efficiency. Um, and that can only be done if we systematically measure, we generate data, we increase the efficiency, we plan and we provide extension services that really make sense. Next slide, please. Now with all the knowledge that comes from a blockchain enhanced system, we need to integrate that or we have the possibility to integrate it. We can keep it as a standalone tool, but we can integrate it into online marketplaces or distribution channels. You can see on the right hand side how many different distribution channels we could only think of. This can be a hospitality sector, it can be NGOs, it can be food banks, charities, donations. It can also go towards new industries that are up and coming, but also processors. I mean, just think of the drying of mangoes, just think of of juicing, um, whatever it is, there are different options. And obviously at the very end, integrate with biomass, energy producers with compost. So sort of go into something more circular than we currently have. Next slide, please. So uh, the system itself is scalable. It's, it works for all countries. It's, uh, we opted for a local use first. We can obviously then also go cross border. We can um, plug in existing systems. We can plug in food banks, charities, any kind of solutions for biomass and compost. Uh, we measure what I said, this water use, CO2 and resor other resource efficiency, which also means the food saved, upcycling of food. But we also integrate transport solutions and transport solutions are extremely important if we want to end up with more efficiency and more efficient supply chains and faster reacting supply chains for perishable food. So it's basically linking missing data, missing food with missing buyers or miss missing consumers. And that would be our smart food loss system. Next slide, please. Now it is an opportunity for success. It's an opportunity for success to feed the world and care for the earth because we fortify, trace, analyze big data. And big data are obviously the future. Big data is used to prevent, to plan and to guide policy options. Because even with a very um, cooperating private sector, which is obviously needed, strong, strong partners to demarginalize, demarginalize the currently uh, invisible food and give it a new life. Um, we still need to complement this and add better infrastructure, better logistics, public-private partnerships, 
and adequate policies. So we think it is an opportunity for success. It's one ingredient and we hope it's gonna be a successful one. Next slide, please. And um, the reloading before loss actually becomes waste is for us very important in these times of crisis. And maybe this crisis has helped us bring these solutions to the forefront, but it will help in the future as well. And uh, it is available and it is something that we should think of and uh, really try to build these alternative supply chains based on available data and provide this data for better planning in the future. Next slide, please. Um, the Secretariat has just shared with you an invitation to the launch event, which takes place next Monday. I will stop with this and hand over to the next speaker. Uh, I very much welcome you on Monday. The details have been shared and I look forward to demonstrate you the actual tool next Monday. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Liniana, for sharing with us um, on the feedback, feed up uh, at UN um, tool. I would like to just uh, focus your attention um, and everybody's attention on, on some key points. You mentioned traceability, so you mentioned to trace, to quantify and analyze food loss and waste. You have mentioned indeed that this is a global issue, food waste, so indeed countries are facing it, whether their food systems are well organized or not and uh, having access to um, resources, financial or other, or not. So this is a global issue that we have to recognize its relevance. And we, we are also dealing with the fact that food losses and waste have been before the COVID crisis and are going to also uh, continue to be if we are not going to address them um, adequately also after. So indeed, we need to work toward a more flexible food supply chain that can address food waste before it happens. So prevention is key. Now I would like to invite everybody to um, for, for the part of that Dr. Liz Goodwin, uh, Senior Fellow and Director of Food Loss and Waste um, at the World Resources Institute is going to um, walk us through. Now Liz is a champion of the UN Sustainable Development Goal 12.3 and the chair of the Long London Waste Recycling Board which brings together London's waste stakeholders and a range of partners to transform management of waste in the, in the capital. Um, before joining WRI, the World Resources Institute as a senior fellow and director, uh, Liz held the position of CEO at the Waste and um, Resources Action Program, uh, RAP, in the UK. Now the floor is yours, Liz. Thank you very much for, for your participation in today's webinar. Thank you very much, um, and I'll just share my screen with you. Okay, so I wanted to talk to you about um, collaboration. Um, and I think both Angela and Liliana have um, emphasised the importance of collaboration. Um, so this is about a, a piece of work that we've been doing under the Champions Initiative, um, which predates COVID, but I think that the whole experience of COVID has brought it home uh, really important, uh, how really important it is that we have good collaboration up and down the supply chain. So initially I'll just skip through a few slides. I mean, most of you will be aware of these figures, you know, that we waste around a third, uh, lose or waste around a third of all food. It costs a huge amount of money to the, to the global economy and it contributes massively to global greenhouse gas emissions. And if it indeed, if it was a, um, a country, it would be the third largest emitter after China and the United States. And at the same time, you know, we have this issue of, um, of malnourishment and hunger. And as Angela has already talked about, you know, we've got we've actually had probably had a growing problem in the last year. And that is going to continue um, as we have um, we continued with COVID-19 and trying to overcome the aftermath of that. And COVID-19 has really brought it home how the supply chains are complicated and they're fractured and they're not very effective. Um, there have been some horrific pictures of you know, milk being poured down the drains, um, uh, crops being just plowed back into the fields. And this is all because the supply chains weren't working properly. And so um, I think that 
the whole um, COVID experience has told us that our food system is not very robust and we need to build it back in a way that makes it more robust and more resilient. And I mean, ask the fundamental question, why do we seek to reduce food loss and waste if the previous slides didn't already illustrate that in massively enough? You know, there's, we need to be able to feed the growing population and we need to be able to feed hungry people now. Um, we've got to protect natural resources. We are putting too much pressure on the world and we are um, having this massive impact on, on climate. And in, there's also, of course, the economic, it increases efficiency, it avoids unnecessary costs, and it helps um, economies and, and families and people to, to, to thrive. And of course, then we have SDG 12.3, which is about halving um, global food waste at the retail and consumer level and reducing loss along the production and supply chains. And the champions um, this was set up to try to help make sure that 12.3 is achieved. And we've set a very simple um, strategy, which is basically target, measure, act. And um, you know, setting a target sets your ambition and sets your, um, your overall goal and says it's important to you. If you measure, then you can actually have that information. You can make informed decisions. Um, and that's exactly what Lily Hallam was just talking about. You know, if you don't know where the problems are, how can you take action? So measurement is really important. And then taking action comes naturally from that. And within Champions, we, we looked at the business case for companies and therefore supply chains to take action. And we did this piece of work a, a few years ago and we looked across more than 700 companies, lots of business sites and lots of countries. And the median company got a 14 to one return on investment. And we weren't talking about big investments either. These were small, simple steps that most organizations could take. So, you know, you have to ask yourself, why aren't more companies doing some of the really obvious things to reduce food loss and waste? And I think a lot of it is down to awareness, but one of the other things is uh, lack of collaboration up and down the supply chain, lack of communication up and down the supply chain. So we then come to 10 by 20 by 30, um, this is a, um, an initiative to basically try to identify 10 really big companies from around the world and ask them to engage with their top 20 suppliers to taking action on food loss and waste and to achieving a halving of food loss and waste by 2030. So the 10 big companies, their 20 suppliers and achieving the target by 2030. And it was built on a, on a model from, um, on the right-hand side, you can see the companies who are, are, have been identified as the 10. In fact, there are 11 of them, but <laughs> we'll, we'll pass over that one. Um, but the, the, the idea was built on an initiative and a process that was tried by um, Tesco, who, who initially went out and worked with their suppliers. And you can see by having 10 companies all working with 10, 20 suppliers, you actually start to get a huge multiplier effect and you start to create a, a huge um, snowball of, of organizations throughout the world, which is exactly what we want to do. So as I said, it was built on T Tesco working with its suppliers. And if we then multiply that up with the others, the, idea, the ask is that each of those 200 organizations adopts 12.3 for their own company, and they look all the way through their supply chain as well as just looking at, at, at themselves. And then they measure their, their food loss and waste and they share the results. And a result, as a result of that, they take action. And what we've seen, from, certainly from the Tesco example and now increasingly from the others, is that that whole process really promotes collaboration and communication up and down the supply chain because people understand start to understand that a decision made in one point of the supply chain has impacts on, on another part of the supply chain that they may have been blissfully unaware of in the past. And this slide, you know, the next two slides give you a very long list of the 200 companies, but it's, it's just to show you the types of organizations. And there's a whole mixture of um, large and small organizations in there. And what's really interesting is that some of these big ones like Unilever is on this list, for example, and Unilever is wanting to work with its entire supply chain. So if we get the 10 by 20 and those 20 then engaging with their supply chain as well, we really do start to see um, massive progress all the way through the supply chains back to the farm level. And this is um, my, my last slide really is just to sort of highlight the fact that this is, it's, it's obviously gone down well. It's um, 
it, it's a good headline figure of the 200. Um, and, and I think it just sort of sets a standard and it sets this whole approach of, of setting a target and setting ambition um, and then measuring because that really gives you the information to take action and then taking action. Um, but all of, all of this would not be possible without collaboration. And that's, that's the, I think, my key message. Um, so now I'll hand back to um, Camilla. Thank you very much, uh, Lilia. Um, indeed, I think that what you have um, highlighted here, the importance of collaboration, um, sorry, Liz, uh, the importance of uh, collaboration is, is key. Now, the 10, 20, 30 initiatives highlights also the fact that we only have 10 years left for the 2030 agenda. So joint action and collaboration among other efforts will determine uh, the success both for stronger supply chain, but also for the 2030 agenda, specifically for the 12.3 goal. So I would like to thank now um, you, um, um, Liz, for, for the presentation and to highlight this, this key point of collaboration, as well as for all the speakers. And uh, without further ado, let me please uh, give the floor to Liliana Novati jakob to moderate the panel discussion. The floor is yours, Liliana. Thank you very much. Thanks much, Camilia, and thank you very much to all the speakers we've had before, and obviously that includes myself, I don't know, quite an awkward situation, but let me start with um, the second part, which is really focused on solutions and what actually happened during the, the crisis. We have heard about um, the food bank before, food waste reduction under COVID happening via food banks. We have heard that the United Nations is working on a solution. Uh, we have heard that the champions 12.3 and companies are taking initiatives. Now we would like to go more onto the ground. Um, let me introduce the panel, which consists of um, three speakers, three participants. The first is Ellen Ottelmans. Ellen Ottelmans is from is the program manager of Impact. Impact is a initiative of the city of Amsterdam with the aim, which has the aim of um, fostering impact entrepreneurship and um, is, in, in my opinion, a great example of how municipalities, how the public sector can effectively engage with the private sector and come up with uh, innovative, inclusive new solutions. We also have uh, Irina Kuzmina. Irina Kuzmina is uh, um, the charity programs manager at X5 Retail Group in Russia. X5 um, is known for working very closely with the Food Bank RUS, Food Bank RAS. Uh, they have jointly developed actually a food collection platform or food collection donation platform and a mobile app where uh, volunteers can sign up. So very interesting how here the private sector and uh, charities work together. And then last but not least, we have um, Bolaj Che. Uh, Bolaj Che is the president of the Hungarian Food Bank Association. He was a founding member uh, 15 years ago of this food bank. And um, we're very curious to hear how Hungary dealt with the situation, how his food bank had to adapt to the new situation. Now, um, let me ask the first question to um, uh, Ellen. Ellen, um, the global crisis has obviously amplified the pressure on the food systems. Uh, on the other hand, as I had also pointed out in my presentation, it did open and it did give, open the gate for uh, innovative new solutions, doing things differently. I was wondering if you could highlight some positive developments that you experienced on how business connected and how they addressed the issue of food waste during the past six months. Ellen. Thank you. Uh, yes, it will be my pleasure to do that because actually, you know, if there's one thing that I've seen and I still see today, actually, uh, the, the past six months and, and up until today, I see a great resilience and also uh, innovative spirit uh, amongst uh, impact enterprises, especially also the ones active in the food waste um, uh, societal challenge. 
And um, I see that they collaborate with each other, they pivot their business models, they find new ways to reach their customers. They even find new customers in these, well, you know, very difficult uh, times. And um, it stems me also hopeful and I, I admire that they are so agile actually. And to give you a few examples, um, there was a, um, a, a, a direct to consumer food box developed within uh, or in Amsterdam. It is called Support Your Locals. Um, and it also uh, uh, offered uh, surplus food to consumers in a direct way. And uh, this initiative uh, uh, materialized into a, into a national platform. So this is one of the examples how food waste enterprises are very resilient. Um, we actually, as Amsterdam Impact, we powered a, a research which has been done by Impact Hub Amsterdam, one of our partners uh, that we collaborate with, and they try to, you know, get a grip or an idea of what are the uh, the consequences of COVID nineteen for food waste uh, enterprises, and they um, hosted a webinar, and there you can see that also Impact Enterprises active in food uh, also connect to their stakeholders. So to give you another concrete example. Uh, too Good To Go, they partnered with the Slow Food Youth um, uh, Movement. Within 14 days, they managed to pile up in a warehouse 20,000 kilograms of potatoes, and then they sold them within a few hours. So I think these are all signs, you know, that people collaborate, know how to find each other uh, across uh, sectors, if you, if you will. Um, I think it also has to do with the fact that food waste enterprises focus on solving an SDG, like a, a societal challenge, which gives them a different perspective. And I feel that as a municipality, we are there. I'm, I mean, it's, it's our core business, so to say, to support these, these uh, developments and also transition to a sustainable food, um, food system. And to give you a small example, we, uh, we focus also on bi-social activities, so market access. And during these difficult COVID times, we also informed consumers that if and when they definitely want to buy something because they need it, they should spend their dime uh, at, at uh, food waste uh, enterprises. So yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful. It's a very difficult time, but I see signs of, of resilience. Thanks much, Ellen. I, I fully agree. The spirit of doing things differently is definitely a great takeaway from this crisis and I hope it will um, mark also 2021 and the years to come. Um, COVID was a tipping point, COVID was um, a trigger and um, it, it, it's very, very nice to hear how fast, particularly you as a municipality and being really at the forefront of the entire public sector um, could react and could encourage and help people who were out to invent something new and do things differently. Um, I was wondering if Irina um, could also tell us how her company adapted. Um, X5 is, is, has been cooperating with uh, food banks for, for many years and um, they for, for has, have been helping to set it up. Has COVID changed anything in terms of uh, cooperation with the food banks? How did your company adapt, Irina? Спасибо, Лилиан. Здравствуйте. Очень приятно было принять ваше приглашение на вебинар. Действительно, мы работаем с Фудбанком уже пять лет. На самом деле, наш Фудбанк единственный в стране. Насколько я понимаю, в Европе существует целая ассоциация, а у нас вот такая большая страна и чудесный Фудбанк, который покрывает всю нашу большую просторную географию. Мы сотрудничаем по направлению Food Drive. Ну, все, наверное, понимают, но для слушателей, которые не так погружены в тему, объясню. Волонтеры Фудбанка приходят в магазины и проводят сбор продовольствия на территории объектов ритейла. 
Таким образом, мы помогли уже 62 тысячам семей, и было собрано 559 тонн продовольствия. К тому же каждый раз после каждого сбора наша компания прибавляет 30% к собранному. То есть мы, безусловно, также участвуем своими продуктовыми пожертвованиями. И наша особенность такова, что мы что продовольственная помощь, которую мы оказываем, является полноценным набором, в котором присутствуют и злаковые, и белковые продукты. В общем, вся, весь набор БЖУ, белков, жиров и углеводов, который необходим человеку. С пандемией, безусловно, у нас не было возможности далее проводить офлайн мероприятия и мы воспользовались нашей онлайн-инфраструктурой. У нас есть сайт, и у нас есть мобильное приложение, в котором мы активизировали наши сборы продовольственные. Ну, фактически люди жертвуют деньги, а потом Фудбанк закупает продукты на собранные пожертвования, и мы также добавляем от себя 30% к собранному. Также вот как уже рассказывала Лиз, мы крупный бизнес, который может коммуницировать с поставщиками, так мы и сделали, мы привлекли примерно 20 крупных компаний и российских, и международных, которые также добавляли свою продукцию, чтобы корзина оставалась разнообразной, в ней присутствовала и сладости, и бытовая химия, и белковые продукты в том числе, и также у Фудбанков встал вопрос, где закупать эти продукты. Да? Люди пожертвовали деньги на сайте и в мобильном приложении. Раньше активно не было у Фудбанка опыта активных закупок. Вот. И в нашей компании открылось такое направление. Теперь ранее мы оптовыми поставками не занимались, теперь для Фудбанка мы делаем такое исключение и вот таким образом помогаем. Thank you very much, Irina. This is very, very interesting and very interesting to see that you also leveraged on new technology to, to distribute and to be fast uh, to distribute the food that you got. And I would really also appreciate your highlighting the role of food banks in terms of um, helping um, reach nutrition levels that um, many affected uh, parts of the population, most affected parts of the population had difficulties um, to cope with. Uh, let me go now to Bala and um, uh, someone who really works with the food banks. And um, I was wondering if Balaj could um, tell us how they coped with this situation. How did they have to uh, adapt their business model, their mode of operation to this um, pandemic and to this exceptional situation? Balaj, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um... Angela has already mentioned a lot of things uh, what, uh, what food banks did during the epidemic uh, um, period. And um, I think also for Hungary, the key word is adaptation. Uh, so we had, had and we have to be very flexible. We also experienced a significant uh, increase uh, on the side of, of, the, of the demand. So we work with uh, 400 charities who are serving about 300 thousand people in need in Hungary and the need rec received from, from them is constantly increasing and especially the winter which is coming now where people will have even less jobs because there won't even be temporary job opportunities in the agricultural sector whereas the family cost will be higher because of the heating so we experience an even worse situation in, uh, in the coming months. Um, and on the other hand, uh, we, we also experienced the volatility on the supply side. Uh, also, the closing down of the food service sector, but we also experienced volatility in the retail sector. For example, the East, Easter period was, uh, was uh, an unexpectedly low retail level uh, in Hungary as for the consumer side, which, uh, which resulted for the food banks and an unexpected high um, uh, supply on the food surplus side. So our, our uh, 
our um, uh, warehouses were full in uh, in April and, and May because of food service and because of the retail and also because of other volatilities. And we had to, had to adapt and be very flexible in the logistics. We operate uh, in, in, a, in a two parallel logistics way. We have, a, we have a, a centralized logistics where goods are coming through central warehouses or regional warehouses. And we also have a decentralized way where our charity partners directly go to the suppliers. And we also had to mix these channels and change these channels. And sometimes we were also uh, involving the suppliers into our logistics chain. So where our warehouses were full, we asked the suppliers to keep and directly distribute it to the charity partners. So we luckily, we can say that we didn't have to decline any uh, offers from suppliers. So we could could distribute everything, um, and we hope to be able to do so. And, uh, uh, and I'm really proud of our team and our volunteers that could do it. And uh, and I hope and I, I wish that in the coming uh, second wave we can uh, do so as well. Thanks so much, uh, Balaj. Um, yes, here as well, faced with new challenges and um, having to come up with new solutions. And um, I really commend you how uh, the food banks could adapt that well to, as you said, volatile supply and huge demand. Um, let me just uh, take up on doing things differently and uh, how this, these lessons learned can be carried over into, into the future. Ellen, um, if I may turn back to you, in your experience, um, what do you think, how could the different stakeholder work together better to achieve more resilient food systems also in the future? Um, what do you think the various roles would be? Uh, thank you. I think collaboration and co-creation is key. Um, not only collaboration as such, but from an equal footing as equal partners. I think that is also a thing that is very, uh, very important. And um, in my opinion, is that either if you are you are a, a, an investor or you are a, a civil servant or you are working at a university, um, you, we all need to stick together to, to improve the situation. And um, in some impact, we, we practice what we preach. We collaborate with different uh, stakeholders, a lot of different stakeholders. To give you an example, how we also uh, adapted our own policy program uh, within the COVID situation. We, uh, we took the initiative to, uh, to develop a program um, specifically for, for um, impact enterprises to, to support them during this COVID uh, crisis, um, but also to make sure that they get out of this uh, situation even stronger than before. So we, we tailor made um, um, a program to support also food waste uh, enterprises. We collaborate with a charity, the Goldschmieding Foundation, um, and these group of, of enterprises are, uh, are supported in different ways. They get coaching and that sort of th things in all kinds of important uh, topics. Next to that, we thought, you know, this is focused on the more mature uh, scale up um, enterprises. Let us also offer something to the entire ecosystem. So also startup uh, food waste uh, enterprises um, ca can, uh, can use these masterclasses, we will offer a, a series of masterclasses. So these are examples of how we try to support and also collaborate with, uh, with all kinds of partners. Um, I have an endless list of, you know, examples of what we do, but maybe I will leave it to, to this. Thank you very much, Alan. We should, certainly won't forget you as a source of, of information and, and lessons learned because, um, as I said, municipalities are really at the forefront and they're really exposed in these situations. And um, I, I, I really look forward to engaging even, even from the United Nations point of view much more with, with you and the municipalities and the cities because I think this is where a lot of the solutions and a lot of the innovative 
um, thinking takes place. And um, I think it's very important that that we come back to what you said. It's it's co-creation with equal among equal partners. And uh, I think that's that's extremely important. Um, as as Liz pointed out in the example before, unless you look at the entire supply chain and you get everybody to understand that everybody has a role to play. Uh, it's not only Tesco, but it's the suppliers of Tesco and every single one of the suppliers to Tesco or whatever other company we are talking about. Um, coming back to the retail level and to IRENA, uh, I know that X5 is uh, very much committed to finding sustainable resources and uh, resource use and, and, and uh, actively looking into reducing food waste. And also doing this um, through opportunities and piloting technolo technological solutions to transfer food waste to further processing. And uh, that includes further processing for into animal feed, fertilizers, biogas. Um, I would also like to know, particularly talking about these long supply chains, um, what about the cooperation with farmers in particular? How do you go to the end of the supply chain and cooperate with them? Irina, the floor is yours. Лилиана, спасибо за вопрос. Да, первым мы действительно препятствуем образованию отходов. Первое, что мы делаем, это мы отслеживаем сроки годности продуктов в наших магазинах. Когда мы видим, что срок годности уже подходит к концу, мы используем технологию Markdown, снижаем цену, и там, в течение трех дней до окончания срока годности люди могут купить эти продукты у нас по сниженной цене. Далее когда срок годности продукта уже э, заканчивается, или, например, э, мы работаем с фруктами и овощами, которые э, потеряли товарный вид, э, у нас есть небольшое отличие от европейского законодательства. Если товары потеряли э, товарный вид, то э, мы должны признавать э, эти товары отходами, а по нашему законодательству мы не можем передавать отходы а, на кормление людей. Поэтому, к сожалению, а, тут исключено а, взаимодействие с фудбанками. Единственное, что мы можем сделать, это передать а, данную продукцию а, либо фермерам, а, либо для производства биогаза, например. А, у нас есть цифры. А, например, в 2018 году мы а, передали 39 тысяч тонн таких товаров вот, на кормление животных, на переработку термическую и на дальнейшее кормление, и на производство биогаза. В прошлом году этот показатель повысился, уже 45 тысяч тонн, и у нас стоит план, что к 2023 году мы хотим не менее 40% таких продуктовых отходов передавать в переработку фермерам или на производство биогаза. Спасибо. Thank you very much. Also a very good example of how we can um, actually further the circular economy in, in this context. And, um, how we are not all alone in this. And this is also my question to Balaj because uh, we have the food banks and uh, we have to look forward. We have more affected people than ever before. Uh, what do you see in terms of possible policy change needed or, or other measures needed to support food banks and food recovery options? What, what do you think is missing or what could help you even more? Balaj, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Um, I see. I see two um, uh, potential uh, uh, policy measures. Uh, one is one is very simple. Um, I think all food redistribution organizations need more financial help and in-kind help, and uh, and more food to be able to serve more <coughs> more people in need. Uh, that's very simple because we are using our maximum capacities, and and we simply can't do more. I mean, volume volunteer work and uh, and uh, and individual and the corporate donations have their limits so uh, so if we want to grow further and serve more people we need more resources 
that's that's one thing. The, the, the other option I see, and uh, we saw a very interesting example in Hungary for that, how um, economical interventions can be connected with social interventions. Um, at the time when, uh, when food processors uh, were hit by the crisis because they lost their market uh, either because of the close down of the of food service sector or the limitations of the export um, uh, markets um, the Hungarian government and the ministry ministry of agriculture has uh, has started an action which was uh, which was an economic help for these companies but with the connection of a social help because the financial help these companies uh, received was with a condition of, uh, of helping food redistribution and charity organizations with food donations. So these companies could use these resources and their capacities to help people in need. And actually now uh, we, we receive uh, uh, a good amount of additional food donations from these companies and thereby I think connecting uh, economic and social uh, measures can be a good solution because these are the two most important aspects I think of the, of the COVID crisis today. Thank you very much, Paul Ajen. I think this is um, a very good closing word also for, for this panel. And uh, I would like to thank all, all panel members. And uh, um, let me immediately go over to the question and answers because um, they're very much linked to what was said before. Um, on the food banks, and particularly the food banks in, in Russia, uh, Irina, I would have a question from you, um, from someone who was wondering why the food bank, why there was only one food bank in Russia. Uh, this RUS fund is the only one that works in the way you described it. Um, what, why do you think there are not more similar initiatives and um, what could be done to improve this situation? Irina. Лилиана, ну, Фудбанк у нас действительно единственный, насколько мы понимаем, да, структуру работы организации, это лицензированная, лицензированная благотворительная организация, и у нас он единственный, который является членом ассоциации. Безусловно, есть другие организации, которые также э, осуществляют деятельность, связанную с, с продовольственной помощью на территории Российской Федерации, но они не такие масштабные, они не покрывают вот, э, даже половины территории нашей страны. Э, и э, действительно, соглашусь э, с предыдущим, выступающим, что, что нужно, да, чтобы появился еще второй, третий фудбанк. Нужны ресурсы, действительно, для этого, наверное, нужно какое-то дополнительное финансирование и нужны кадры, нужны люди, которые будут достаточно компетентны, чтобы вести такую деятельность. Uh, thank you, Irina. Yes, this is this is a bit the tone that that we heard uh, in many cases, and that certainly help um, to to increase the number of food banks and initiatives. I have um, a question regarding one of the initiatives that is the largest scale initiative mentioned by Liz. Liz, uh, in your view, would would the initiative ten times twenty times thirty be feasible and effective in lower income countries? Yes, I think so. And I think um, there's every possibility that it will eventually get down to um, developing countries um, because some of those supply chains that people like Tesco, you know, they buy, mm -hmm. they buy crops that originally started in Kenya. Um, so there's no reason why eventually it won't get to right back down to the farm level. Um, I also see um, great potential for, for regional um, approaches being taken as well. I don't think it should be limited to okay, we've set up this, this global um, approach. There's no reason why a region couldn't do something which would actually allow you to get more quickly to, to some of the real farmer level interventions. Thanks so much, Liz. And uh, this also begs the question which was asked and I would like to call on Robert to, um, 
to answer this question, what do you think the government's role is in all this? We've heard a lot about private sector initiatives, about the food banks, about the role of the NGOs. Um, a question from the floor is now, what is the government's role in reducing food waste in the current situation? Uh, thank you. Um, the government, from the beginning uh, of this uh, global program on food loss and waste reduction, we have been uh, combining the three major uh, sectors to work together, which are the public sector, uh, that includes the governments, the municipalities, the UN and EU institutions. Then there is the civil society, which are the NGOs, the food banks, the charities, etc. And there is the private sector, which are the, the ones who really uh, produce and distribute the food and who actually also lose and waste the food. So they are the ones who really need to reduce uh, food waste. The private sector, including the farmers, the, the industry, the processors, the retailers, uh, the horeca. And then, of course, there is the, the general public, the consumers, who uh, take an, uh, for their part a big deal of the food waste. Now, the, the role of the, the public sector, the government, is clearly to analyze and understand the reasons why food is being lost or wasted, and what are the causes, and what are the reasons behind the causes, and why does the problem not solve itself. And then, with this knowledge, uh, develop policy and legislation which is conducive for the private sector to act and to take uh, the right measures to uh, reduce food loss and waste. It has to uh, be economically and, and uh, socially acceptable and profitable for the private sector to take the right action to reduce uh, food waste, especially food waste, which is uh, a behavioral thing. And, uh, uh, and therefore, uh, people, both in private sector as well as at, at uh, individual level, need, need to change their attitudes and their behavior in order to uh, to reduce food waste, and that is where the public sector uh, plays an, uh, a strong role by uh, creating the right policy and legislative environment for the private sector to act and the, the right uh, awareness raising and motivation for people to change their attitudes. Thank you. Thanks much, Robert. And um, I fully agree. It takes all players to actually bring about any kind of change or any kind of resilience building here. And uh, the way the, the crisis worked in the beginning was a bit confused, but I think uh, a lot of the players did realize that alone they cannot do it. Um, I would have one question for Angela. Um, the food banks played an extremely in important role. And um, I was wondering, and that is a question from the floor, how did you or do you preserve the food you keep in your food banks? Um, how fast do you have to get them out of your warehouses or how does that work in practice? Over to you, Angela. Well, thank you very much for the question, uh, first of all. Uh, I would say that, well, uh, especially during the, the pandemic, so today, but also uh, in our, let's say, daily activity, um, uh, the goal is to, to keep the food um, in the warehouses, in the food banks uh, um, for a very short period, because uh, as you can imagine, most of the food which is recovered by the food banks is food which is uh, really close to the expiry date. Uh, so the, the, the role of the food banks is to pick up this food. Uh, and as Balash said, um, there, are, there is usually a centralized and a decentralized uh, logistics. So most of the times the food is picked up and uh, then um, stored in the warehouse where it is selected and also sorted and then redistributed to the charities or it is directly redistributed by the, to the charities without passing through the food bank, through uh, the warehouse, uh, because the goal is to redistribute the food as soon as possible so that in this way, the charities and the final, and the final beneficiaries have enough time to, to consume the food. 
Uh, so really the, the goal is not to store uh, the food or to preserve the food in the warehouses, in the food banks, uh, but to have a very quick uh, and agile uh, logistics so that uh, people have a lot of time to, to consume the food. Thanks much, Angela. Um, I hope this answered the questions. It's certainly not the aim of the game to push food waste further down the chain and into the food banks. That's um, definitely any, any food bank has to think of that and, and the fast distribution and the fast reacting supply chains coming back would be very, very, and very important part of, of such a strategy. Um, with this, I would like to wrap up uh, the session of Q&A and uh, thank everyone, thank the participants and thank the organizers for having us, uh, thank all the panelists. And with this, hand over to Robert for the closing remarks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you too. Um, actually, uh, the, the question uh, just asked to me uh, already gave me an opportunity to uh, make most of the remarks that I had intended for my closing remarks. Um, as far as the private sector is concerned, they are the most important uh, actors uh, to, to reduce food loss and waste, together with the consumers, I have to say that. Uh, you may notice that the private sector is not always present in this type of webinars and uh, discussion platforms. I, I see it in a rather positive way because they, are, they have a business to run and they don't have so much time for uh, talking. And it is also not really their role to uh, create the awareness like we are doing through this uh, webinar or so. You can rest assured that in the, the programs and projects that we are uh, implementing in different countries in the world, that we closely and continuously interact and engage with the private sector because as i said we need to know uh, how we can help them to reduce food loss and food waste in their uh, business and in the value chains that they are uh, operating and the, the strategy of the safe foods uh, initiative at the moment is to address food loss and waste at national level uh, because that is an and, and the, the, the nation, the food system in a country is an entity that uh, uh, can be controlled and influenced and supported uh, to, to reduce food loss and waste. And therefore, in those countries, we develop national food loss and waste reduction strategies, uh, which will be supervised and implemented by a consortium of public, private sector partners and civil society. That is the approach that we that we follow, and uh, it seems to be uh, we, are, we are in most countries. We are now at the level of finalizing national strategies, and we hope we, we will be able to get resources in order to start implementing these strategies as well. And uh, a project like we are uh, have been discussing here in with regard to uh, um, addressing uh, recovery and redistribution of surplus food as a result of the COVID pandemic. Could be one very good example of uh, implementation of uh, such strategies. Then before I close I would like to mention that uh, this webinar is one of a series organized by FEO's regional office for Europe and Central Asia and the next webinar will take place next week on 18 November and the topic is seed systems in the time of COVID-19 challenges and opportunities agricultural seed systems. Uh, in uh, in the region and uh, with this i would like to again to thank everyone who participated and to thank all the participants who were here and uh, we hope that uh, from what we have been discussing we will uh, have an opportunity to continue collaboration and expand collaboration in order to implement food loss and waste reduction in the region and in the world thank you very much again